I think my uh, major task this morning is to demonstrate that it can still be fashionable to wear turtlenecks. <laughs> you just have to pair it with tweed, and then it works. <sighs> okay, let me begin with this. Not long ago, I invited a young couple to my home. I had been asked to meet with them from, uh, there were some friends of mine at the church, and they were the parents of the wife in that couple, and the couple was struggling with their marriage. To them, at that point, divorce seemed like the only option, the only way to end the pain, or at least hopefully stop it from getting any worse. But part of the problem was that their suffering was cutting them off from their family and from their friends. I'm not going to tell you exactly what the problem was, of course, but they could go out with their friends in the evening and have dinner and so forth, and they could laugh and they could enjoy themselves and pretend that everything was all right, and then go home and feel a little empty because of the time. Their family members certainly sympathized, but they had no idea what to say to them. And the two of them were too emotionally reactive to be able to really express their pain fully to each other. When they tried to do that, it only drove them further apart. So I was there for consultation and for pastoral support. So I only met with them twice. I listened carefully, of course, and I validated their suffering and normalized it. I helped them to structure some positive interaction into their relationships and to put some boundaries on the negative. I gave them referrals to two local therapists and I coached them on how to make the decision and then made them promise me that they were going to follow up. And then of course I prayed with them. So from my perspective, nothing that I did with them was particularly unusual or remarkable, but even with such simple interventions, you could see the change in their demeanor. They didn't feel so lost and alone anymore. They began to have just a little bit of hope that maybe things could be different in their relationship because there were people that they could talk to, people that they could trust. Now, at, at the end of our time together, at the end of our second session, I asked them if they had any questions for me. And they only had one, and it was perhaps the most important question. They said, is there any hope for us? Now, of course, they're not looking for a Bible verse, and they're not looking for a formal prognosis, but they were asking for reassurance as they began to let themselves believe that it might be possible to actually save the marriage. They trusted me, and they needed to hear me say it. Yes, there is always hope. And they brightened up, and we said goodbye. Now, after they left the house, I was sort of of two minds. On the one hand, I felt privileged to have been there, to have seen that little sparkle return to their eyes. But on the other hand, I couldn't help wondering how many other people there were in the congregation who were suffering alone. Suffering because they couldn't talk to anybody. They had to, every week, put on a good face and pretend to be better than they actually were. We in the church are called to be a community of hope but we can be remarkably intolerant of brokenness. We prefer a tacit theology in which we act as if believers should already have triumphed over everything in Jesus. And anybody who continues to suffer just needs to get with the program. The very thought of that made me a little sad. And ironically, I found myself asking the same question that I had just been asked. Is there any hope for us? And the answer, of course, is still yes, but given the challenges that all of us continue to face in our congregations, I have to keep reminding myself that this is so. Now, the answer, now what we're gonna be dealing with in today's lecture then, and I want to introduce the concept of clinical virtue. That's part of how I teach integration and the vocation of peacemaking. Hope is going to be the first of two clinical virtues that we'll be talking about today, followed by humility. And tomorrow, we'll get on to the last two, which are compassion and Sabbath rest. Now, when I talk about clinical virtues, of course, I'm not implying that the clinic is the only place that you're going to find these things. Quite the contrary. I believe that all of these things are an embodiment of the vocation that is shared by all Christians to be agents of God's shalom. So to speak of the clinical virtues, then,
is to suggest that each one of them has a practical and clinically meaningful expression within what we call the secondary vocational domain of psychotherapy. Talked about that yesterday. All right, so if we look at the field of bioethics, for example, there's been an ongoing and vigorous debate between the proponents of opposing models. To oversimplify for the sake of argument, there is the principle-based approach, which some people call principalism. That's a little bit hard to say. It doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. And that privileges a small set of supposedly universal moral principles like beneficence. In other words, you should always work for the good of your clients, non-maleficence. You should always strive to at least do no harm. Autonomy, you need to respect the independence of your clients and justice. You need to treat everyone fairly. When we're working from a principalist approach, we tend to rely upon case studies of moral quandaries particularly in the realm of medicine, in which difficult decisions have to be made, and the way that you justify those decisions is on the basis of how well the decisions actually embody principles like this and any other moral rules that might be related to them. Now, the alternative then, or one of the alternatives to principalism on the other side, is a whole range of virtue and character-based approaches that tend to emphasize the importance of narrative. These tend to treat each medical decision as a unique moral situation. The patient's stories and meanings are to be privileged over universal moral principles. If it can be said that principle-based approaches to bioethics ask, what shall I do? Then it can also be said that virtue and narrative approaches focus more on the question of who must I be, particularly when we're talking about difficult moral situations. So if you think, for example, of end-of-life medical decisions, and this is one of these things that's become particularly relevant for us, uh, for my wife and I in these days as we watch our friends get older and so on. When it comes to making end-of-life medical decisions, which one is more important? Prolonging the patient's life or preserving the quality of the patient's life? Which one should we privilege? Supposedly universal moral principles governing medical practice? and patient care, or the particularities of each patient's personal narrative and how they want their stories to end. And if you're the patient, what kind of a person do you want your doctor to be? Rita Chiron, who specializes in both internal medicine and literature, there's a nice combination for you, writes of a patient who came to consult with her about his back pain, quote, as his new internist, I tell him, I have to learn as much as I can about his health. Could he tell me whatever he thinks I should know about his situation? And then I do my best not to say a word, not to write in his chart, but to absorb all that he admits about his life and his health. I listen not only for the content of the narrative, but for its form. I pay attention to the narrative's performance, the patient's gestures, expressions, body positions, tones of voice. After a few minutes, he stops talking and begins to weep. I ask him why he cries. He says, no one has ever let me do this before. Now, that's really different from a scenario that I still have in mind when I once took my mother to see a pain specialist. Because during the clinical interview, he would glance at her every once in a while, but most of the time he was looking at his computer screen. She was facing him, and she was trying in vain to make eye contact. He asked her about symptoms, but she tried to tell him the story of what it's like to be her and what it's like to live in a body that has to deal with chronic pain. He listened for the information that he needed to make a diagnosis and possibly a treatment plan, but she just wanted to be heard and understood. Charon insists that physicians need what she calls narrative competence, the ability to hear and respond appropriately to patient stories. Because without this, they may make medical decisions that are ethically justifiable from a principalist standpoint, but at the cost of treating the patient as a cipher, as a nameless body of symptoms. Now, many ethicists, of course, argue that the choice between principles and stories is not black and white, it's not either or. 
If you were here yesterday and you heard the lecture and you heard uh, Hak Jun's response to that, I think that's the tension that he was trying to deal with in there, that there are ways of being a narrative ethicist that's so focused on stories that makes it impossible to answer the question of whether or not there are such things as universal principles. And if there were, how could we possibly know what they are, right? So on the one hand, we need those principles. Those principles are going to safeguard at least minimal standards of care. They're going to tell us what we're obligated to do, and they're going to tell us what we shouldn't do. On the other hand, a respect for stories helps practitioners to make treatment decisions that are most in line with the patient's own goals. But of course, it's not just the patient's stories that matter because the debate between principle-based and narrative forms of ethics is, after all, the debate over professional ethics. So it's not about the role of the client's narrative should play in treatment decisions. It's not just that. It's about the role that a therapist's narratives will play in his or her professional and moral formation. The narratives that make sense of our question about what kind of people we must strive to be as practitioners. There's more to sound ethical practice than just the application of universal principles. Even the authors of the best known principle-based text in bioethics would say that. Here's a quote. What often matters most in the moral life is not adherence to moral rules, but having a reliable character, a good moral sense, and an appropriate emotional responsiveness. Our feelings and concerns for others lead us to actions that cannot be reduced to merely following rules, and morality would be a cold and uninspiring practice without appropriate sympathy, emotional responsiveness, excellence of character, and heartfelt ideals that reach beyond principles and rules. So when we speak of the clinical virtues, then, we're speaking of a therapist's character and not just his or her technical expertise or ability to apply ethical principles. So if you would, I'm going to ask you to do a little thought experiment with me. I want you to reflect for a moment on the following question. Can one be a successful therapist without being a person of good character? I would guess that some of you probably are thinking to yourself, well, it depends on what you mean by success, right? <laughs> What do you mean by success? It's not difficult, for example, to imagine a therapist who's successful in a business sense, but ethically challenged. For example, somebody who fosters the dependency of high paying clients long past the point where the therapist is able to do them any good. It might be comforting to think that therapists who have uh, sort of poor character would be eventually weeded out by low demand or that all morally upright therapists would be rewarded with financial success. <laughs> but that's not always the world in which we work. Now, there are other ways then that we might consider a therapist to be successful, ways that come closer to what we might mean by a good therapist as opposed to merely a successful therapist. At a minimum, of course, a good therapist must be a technically competent therapist. By our modernist and instrumentalist ways of thinking, therapists must possess the specialized knowledge and skills needed to be professional change agents. And indeed, our textbooks are full of case studies that say, here's how therapy A is superior to therapy B. And it gives the impression that if you just learned therapy A and learned it really, really well, that's all you would need to be a good and successful therapist, okay. especially restoration therapy, for example. <laughs> now, that's true to an extent. But research on psychotherapy outcomes, of course, suggests that specific strategies that might make therapist A, therapy A, different from therapy B, might explain only a small part of what actually makes therapy effective. Some scholars argue that the most important factors in predicting therapeutic outcome are instead the ones that are shared in common across treatments, including things like the client's characteristics, such as their level of distress, or their degree of impairment. Certainly, there shouldn't be any uh, surprise there. Another well-researched common factor is the quality of the therapeutic alliance, that is, of the working relationship established between the therapist and the client, with the contribution from the therapist side being of particular importance. Such research demands ask, they, they ask that we have to think about the personal qualities of the therapist. 
that are involved in good therapy beyond technical expertise in theory-specific interventions. Now, most of us, I think, believe that at least intuitively that a good therapist must also be a person of good character, even if it's not always said aloud. Again, this is not merely a matter of rule following. The one who adheres to ethical codes to avoid getting in trouble is not a good therapist. Nor is the one who considers the profession of psychotherapy to be nothing more than a decent source of extrinsic rewards like income or social status. Rather, a good therapist, to borrow a concept from Alistair McIntyre, pursues the moral goods that are internal to the practice itself. So what do we mean by that, right? The moral goods intrinsic to the practice itself. Therapy can sometimes be a grueling profession. Did I hear any amens on that? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So what is it that keeps therapists at it? Year after year, client after client. It's not, I hope, for the extrinsic rewards alone, like money or status. Certainly you want to make some money at it or else you're not going to be able to keep doing it either. But it's for the intrinsic ones. It's for the rewards that are inseparable from the practice of therapy. To be a good therapist, for example, requires continual self-scrutiny, which at times may feel burdensome. But as Irvin Yalom has insisted, this is also an occupational privilege because it means that the active therapist is never stagnant, but always growing and evolving as a person. There was one study of therapists, for example, in which the vast majority of participants, when they were asked, would all say that being a therapist had made them better people. Now, it's not the case necessarily that therapists are always going to experience those intrinsic rewards in every session, but they and others in the helping professions are sustained by the occasional deep satisfaction of knowing that they've made a difference in somebody's life, that they walked with somebody in their suffering and it actually made a difference. Now, if we could draw even further then from McIntyre, we might conceive of virtue as, quote, an acquired human quality, the possession and exercise of which tends to enable us to achieve those goods which are internal to practices and the lack of which effectively prevents us from achieving any such goods, okay? That's a mouthful. Basically, the idea is that there are particular practices and there are particular things that we need to be able to do, attitudes, dispositions, and so forth, to be able to achieve and have the goods that are part of that practice. And so if we're talking about clinical virtues then, what we would be talking about are the stable traits and habits and dispositions that therapists would actually cultivate through the practice of psychotherapy itself which would make it possible to experience the goods that are intrinsic to that practice. Many candidates for clinical virtues have been suggested. From a principalist point of view, for example, if you think of beneficence and autonomy as being key ethical principles, then benevolence and respect would be the kinds of qualities that you might want to find in a person who would then embody those principles. To these, another theorist has added such worthy traits as prudence, perseverance, courage, public spiritedness, and yes, integrity and hope and humility. Moreover, McIntyre insists that virtue is not merely about the goods internal to practices, but of the telos of human life in general, by which moral acts are made intelligible by some overarching narrative. So as I suggested yesterday, I believe peacemaking to be one such vocational narrative. And I believe that hope and humility and compassion are intrinsic to the logic of peacemaking in Jesus's Beatitudes. Now, Sabbath rest does not flow directly from those verses, but I include it because I believe that some form of Sabbath practice and not just what is called self-care in the literature is crucial if we are to have a right relationship to both what we called our primary and secondary vocations. So for the remainder of this lecture, the task is to examine the virtues of hope and humility in order to see their relationship to the Beatitudes and to peacemaking and how they might function as clinical virtues. The very notion of a telos, of an end, as we saw it in McIntyre, to human existence already puts us in the territory of hope. 
because the benefits of hope as a psychological trait have been studied extensively. The classic formulation of hope theory by Rick Snyder, you may be familiar with that, for example, defines hopefulness as having the will and the ways with respect to our personal goals. He uses that word will to talk about that sense of personal agency in which a hopeful person believes that he or she can do things that will help to achieve their goals. He uses that word ways to talk about being able to see a pathway to get to the goal that you actually want. And both forms of cognitive appraisal work together. Now, note that this is not the same thing as unbridled optimism and just thinking that whatever you want is going to come to pass. This is not a Pollyanna kind of denial of obstacles or challenges because the truly hopeful person is realistic in assessing what it will actually take to reach a goal. But compared to the person who is low in hope, one who is hopeful believes that she will in fact attain her goals and experiences a higher degree of motivation and positive emotion as she focuses on the possibility of success instead of on those dismal predictions of failure. Now, if you think back to the couple that I was describing at the beginning of the lecture, you can see an increase in both agency and pathways thinking in their experience. Because at the end of the first meeting, I gave them, again, a simple but highly structured homework assignment to give them a much needed experience of positivity. I warned them to not go beyond what I told them to do in case they go badly and then they get discouraged again. So they followed the instructions and they had a small victory. And I do mean a small victory but it was a victory nonetheless. And that paid an additional dividend to them in terms of hope. So when I met with them the second time, the final time, they were much more ready to believe that they could actually do something to improve their marriage and that consulting with a therapist would actually help. So hope provides the motivation for tackling one's goals. And there's ample evidence that being more hopeful is associated with more successful outcomes. So for example, some of the research results, children who are more hopeful feel more competent and have lower rates of depression. Hopeful track and field athletes perform better than their less hopeful peers, even after you factored out differences in actual athletic ability. Hopeful students, like so many people in the room, are less likely to view failures as setbacks. Now, all this kind of research then suggests that there's a benefit to assessing people's level of hope and then coaching them and encouraging them to set goals and to take steps towards those goals. The agency dimension of hope seems to increase in the earlier stages of therapy. People, in, when they first get into therapy, believe that something may be possible, and then the pathway side of that becomes clearer in the later stages of therapy. As people begin to apply what they're learning, it can actually see the road towards getting to where they want to be. So hopeful thinking, in other words, can be cultivated through therapeutic means. How do therapists do that? a selection of different possibilities. Hope can, of course, be an explicit topic of conversation. Therapists might use the language of hope to actually encourage clients to think about their hope story and how the past and the present might cohere in that way and how they might lead to a desired future. But it can also be done implicitly, even if the word hope is never mentioned. Therapists can empathetically validate the client's feelings of hopelessness, for example, or point out the resources that a client may have forgotten about. They can recognize the strength it took to even come and seek help in the first place and then say, this is what you're going to need in order to succeed in therapy. Now, all of that then points back to that common factors argument and the role of client expectancy. To what extent is the outcome of therapy tied to the client's expectations as to whether or not therapy is going to be helpful. And here, and a little bit amusingly to me at least, I'm reminded of how researchers are rethinking the nature and the importance of placebo effects. In psychotherapy outcome research, the methodological gold standard is the randomized clinical trial. And so you gather together your participants. Some of them are randomly assigned to the therapy or the treatment condition. Another group is randomly assigned to a no treatment or to a placebo condition. 
And in the placebo condition, there's no active intervention, but participants, participants might actually believe that what they're getting is going to help. Even if, for example, they think they are uh, getting some kind of new experimental medication, but it's really just a sugar pill. So in order for the actual therapy condition to be considered effective, it has to outperform the placebo condition. Now, the logic of that design, of course, makes sense, but it betrays an underlying bias with respect to what counts as a real therapeutic intervention or a cure. The real treatment is the one that the therapist intends, while the client's expectations are treated as a nuisance factor. And that bias has been challenged by researchers who study the placebo effect in its own right. How might, for example, changing the shape or the size or the color of the pill make a difference to the outcome, even if the pill itself is chemically inert? One science journalist summarizes some of the research. Quote, big pills tend to be more effective than small ones. <laughs> Two pills at once work better than one. Colored pills tend to work better than white ones, although which color is best depends on the effect that you're trying to create. Blue tends to help sleep, whereas red is good for relieving pain. Green pills work best for anxiety. There are cultural differences, however, emphasizing the point that any effects depend not on the placebos themselves, but on what they mean to us. For example, although blue tablets generally make good placebo sleeping pills, they tend to have the opposite effect on Italian men. <laughs> Possibly because blue is the color of their national football team. <laughs> so they find it arousing rather than relaxing. <laughs> so what those kinds of findings actually suggest is that the common factor of a client's expectations is indeed part of what makes treatment effective. And all that suggests that therapists need to be conscious of the possible benefits of hope and to seek to foster that in their clients. But again, when we're talking about a clinical virtue, it's hope as a trait of the clinician that we want to focus in on and not just as a trait of the client. And unfortunately, there's been far, far less research on the hopefulness of therapists. To be sure, many therapists are familiar with the experience of feeling hopeless in the face of their most difficult cases. One therapist, for example, wrote of her feelings of failure as a novice practicum student, and having said that, I don't want to bump up the anxiety of practicum <laughs> students in the room, but there it is. Her feelings of failure as a novice practicum student treating a dual diagnosis borderline client with whom none of her colleagues wanted to work. She was filled with youthful enthusiasm and intent on saving the world, quote, one client at a time, <laughs> but quickly found herself over-involved and overwhelmed. Snyder might say that this therapist lost both her sense of agency and of a pathway to success, and she felt hopeless and flustered. The therapy floundered and eventually failed. There is some empirical evidence that the therapist's own positive expectation of change is an important ingredient in therapy. There was one recent study, for example, in which researchers found that therapist expectations explained a little over 7% of the outcome, which may not sound like much, but it was statistically significant. The authors of another study reported that even when client hope increased during therapy, it wasn't the client's hope that actually predicted the outcome. It was the therapist's hope. Now, more research is actually needed to understand how and why this might be so, but such findings lend credence to the notion of hope as a clinically relevant virtue. As theologian William May asks, though, what would be the metaphysical horizon of such hope? May argues that people give authority to helping professionals in the hope of finding release from suffering. And in response, helpers are tempted to play Messiah or else to shield themselves from that pain by hiding behind an emotionally detached kind of professionalism. What Christian practitioners in particular need is theological warrant for their own ongoing hope as they are confronted day after day by the heartbreaking reality 
of human frailty and hopelessness. William May finds that warrant in Isaiah in the description of God's suffering servant as, in the classic King James formulation, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He believes that we don't have to play Messiah because we already have a Messiah who has suffered and who has died to give his life to others. We don't have to protect ourselves from pain because death itself is no longer to be feared. We are freed, in his words, quote, to perform whatever acts of kindness and service we can and even to receive them from others as a limited sign of a huge mercy which our own works have not produced. And as we'll see, I find warrant for hope in the biblical metaphor of the kingdom of God, which as Brueggemann has observed, stands at the center of the social imagination of Jesus. The Beatitudes, I believe, are an excellent example of that vision and therefore of the metaphysical horizon of a Christian therapist's hope. I've been teaching a, an, adult, an adult Bible class nearly every Sunday morning now for over 20 years, and I usually avoid using too many theological terms because I've had folks who will sit there and they sort of stare blankly at me for most of the lesson and then come up afterwards and tell me not to make it so complicated <laughs> because the only thing that really matters is that we love Jesus, right? <laughs> and I understand the mentality. If things start sounding too academic, what happens is people begin to check out mentally, and I don't want to confuse them unnecessarily. But there have been some theological terms that I've insisted that everyone learn. And one of them is eschatology. I have gone so far as to make them say it out loud along with me. <laughs> it's one of those Mr. Rogers moments, right? <laughs> Can you say eschatology? <laughs> I knew you could. <laughs> now, I do that because I want them to notice how consistently the biblical authors evaluate the present in terms of God's demonstrated faithfulness in the past and in terms of their hope for God's continued faithfulness in the future. Such a biblically grounded hope is the counterargument to the kind of theological narcissism that we talked about yesterday. The Christian life is not just about enjoying a private relationship with God, and it's not about how God is a powerful, saving character in our own individual stories. It's about cultivating the eschatological imagination that we need for our stories to be caught up into the narrative of God's restoration of shalom to all creation. And the Beatitudes help us do this. So Jesus declares at the beginning of the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And if you go down a little ways, he says, blessed too are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And again, it's because the kingdom is theirs as well. This is a present tense reality. Theirs is the kingdom. And for those who are accustomed to the world's ideas of success and perhaps even a narcissistic theology of how God rewards nice or properly religious people, these sound like very odd ways to talk about blessing. If we come to the gospel from a, a position of pride and of privilege, Jesus' words about poverty of spirit and persecution will hardly sound like good news. The point is even sharper in the gospel of Luke where Jesus not only pronounced blessings upon those who were poor and hungry and weeping and ostracized, but also pronounced corresponding woes on those who were rich, well-fed, laughing, and treated with respect. Now, some scholars will actually read those words against the background assumptions of a culture of honor and shame. Jesus is essentially giving honor to those who in that culture would typically be dishonored. And let's face it, who among us, even today, would not rather be rich, full, happy, and respected? The Beatitudes seem to point to a kingdom that's upside down from the values and the priorities that even God's own people had come to take for granted. Now, on the other hand, if we come to the Beatitudes as people who are already poor in spirit, powerless, or marginalized, then suddenly Jesus' words become good news. Jesus is not preaching a program of religious self-improvement. He's bringing good news to those who need it and want it the most, announcing to the poor in spirit that the very kingdom is theirs. It's not because they deserve it. It's not because they've earned it. 
It's because they have a king who has graciously embraced them, a king who embodies the essence of humility and compassion and calls his followers, rich or poor, to do the same. For Christians, the virtue of hope is grounded in the faith that God's blessing of the poor in spirit is the sign of an eschatological promise. One day, there will be justice. The divine project of peace that is already underway will someday be complete, and all will be as it should be. Jesus invites his hearers to see the sufferings of the present in terms of the long view of biblical history. He ends the Beatitudes with this, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So those who suffer persecution in the present for Jesus' sake are invited to look both to the future and to the past. So rejoice, because your reward in heaven is great. But now think back to the prophets, right? In their day, they were persecuted and they were dishonored. But don't you honor them now? This is why, then, you need to rejoice, because your reward is part of a glorious storied history that began long before you were born and will end long after you die. In the Apostle Peter's language, Christian hope is a living hope. It's the assurance that we have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, and it's being kept for us. So theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, twice. Those are present tense declaration, and they bookend a whole string of future promises. Those who mourn will be comforted. Those who are meek will inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. Those who are merciful will receive mercy. Those who are pure in heart will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. What I want to suggest to you is that the Christian virtue of hope resides in that historical space between theirs is and they will. Theirs is the kingdom. Despite possible appearances to the contrary, we accept in faith that the kingdom is a present reality and that God, who is sovereign, cares about the plight of those who have to live with oppression and shame. And because of that, we can cultivate the vision that we need to enjoy glimpses of truth that are afforded to us by the Spirit. And they will. We joyously anticipate the kingdom's final glorious consummation. That's not just optimism, again. Hope to be biblical hope has to be courageously clear-eyed and realistic about evil and suffering, and yet at the same time dare to remember that under the sovereignty of God, slavery leads to exodus, crucifixion leads to resurrection. Now, hope then, as a virtue, is closely tied to humility. And indeed, you might have already heard hints of humility as we've read the Beatitudes. Again, Jesus describes those who are poor in spirit and meek and mourning and hungering and thirsting for righteousness as blessed. And again, in Luke, it's just those who are just plain poor, not poor in spirit, right? They're blessed. It's those who are hungry. It's not those who are hungry for righteousness or justice. It's those who weep or are hated or excluded by others. Jesus isn't teaching that it's morally superior to be lowly, oppressed, or marginalized. These people are not blessed because there is something intrinsically good, right, or desirable about being poor or hungry. They're blessed because the kingdom of God belongs to them, because they are the recipients of God's favor and of God's eschatological promises. The proclamation of blessing, in a way, is less about who they are than about who God is, and that proclamation is good news indeed. Small wonder that people flock to Jesus in person. Humility, I believe, is the proper response to this good news. One might say that Jesus is actually describing humiliation, the state of being humbled or brought low by one's life circumstances, rather than humility as a virtue or character strength per se. But the association is unavoidable because both are characterized by lowliness. For many people, the word humility, therefore, has connotations of an undesirable weakness of character 
And it's only with the advent of positive psychology, for example, that empirical interest in the possible benefits of humility has grown. But researchers take pains to distance the concept of humility from stereotypical associations with lowliness. From a psychological point of view, if you have a habitually low opinion of yourself, that sounds more like character pathology than a character strength, right? And that's why we prefer this notion of having an accurate view of oneself, a view that includes both strengths and weaknesses. But then there's that empirical problem that people have struggled with. By what criteria should researchers measure the accuracy of people's self-concepts? For that matter, some scholars even worry about the problem of measuring humility at all. Do you ask people to rate their own humility? Do you ask them how humble their friends think they are? Both of those methods have actually been used, and researchers are still working at untangling the methodological knots. Nevertheless, there have been numerous studies that have examined a variety of expressions of humility across a wide range of domains. And some concept of humility seems necessary to our understanding of both personality and of relational health. Humility seems to be one of the traits that underlies positive change in relationships and in relational therapy. One research team has written this way, humility influences the self in a variety of ways. It opens us up to be influenced, to accept responsibility, to forgive. It increases our willingness to admit to problems and to consider ways to improve our relationships. Humility seems to help us look past our own egos and to do so in an honest and non-defensive manner. My colleague Terry Hargrave, for example, has argued that when two individuals marry, a third and a shared identity is created. Whereas before there was you and there was me, now there is us. And humility in marriage entails each individual being willing to make sacrifices to keep us healthy. This relational humility can be seen in the willingness of each spouse to respond positively to bids for emotional connection, even when they're not finished being angry, or in their commitment to listen to each other and to be affected and influenced by what they hear. Few couples, of course, come to a therapist's office seeking to grow in humility. <laughs> but therapists will implicitly work with them to increase their humility just the same. So it helps in our personal relationships to be humble. But again, what about in our professional relationships? Is there such a thing as a clinical virtue of humility? Now, in some ways, the very idea flies in the face of cultural values that assign worth and status to people with advanced degrees, important sounding titles, and social power over the lives of others. And there are, of course, therapists who will caution against professional arrogance. Harlene Anderson, for example, on the basis of her thoroughly postmodern assumptions, famously advocated that therapists should all adopt what she calls a not knowing stance. And when that first came out, people got really confused as to what she could possibly mean by that, because they would say, well, you know, I was not knowing before I went to graduate school. <laughs> so why did I spend all that money and all that time to get a degree and to get a license just to go into the room and be not knowing? If that's the case, what is it that actually makes me an expert? Why should I charge money, right? Those kinds of doubts are understandable, but they also betray that kind of modernist expectation of what it means to be an expert in the first place. Now, it's not that specialized knowledge is unnecessary or unimportant, but the key question is, how does one hold that knowledge in the context of a relationship in which there is a built-in disparity of power? Therapy isn't the impersonal application of technical skill. It's the creation and the maintenance of a collaborative relationship of trust. And on one side, you have a client, and that client may already feel diminished, but they're required by their role to be vulnerable. And on the other side sits the therapist. And the therapist has authority that is granted institutionally by the social construction of his or her professional role. Therapists have power over the lives of others, and what they do with that power matters. Let's be honest. We enjoy experiencing the fruit of our professional power. Yes, in part, it's because we want to help others, and we like seeing that sparkle in their eyes. We like seeing them get better and having hope restored. 
But our motives are not always entirely other-directed and altruistic. We enjoy bringing order to chaos because we like feeling powerful. We like the sense of agency and accomplishment that comes along with being what Irvin Yalom has said, the midwife to the birth of something new. That can be a beautiful instance of peacemaking. But if the truth be told, our uses of power are not always for the good of the client. Haven't we ever jumped the gun on an intervention because we were tempted to be all-knowing or wanted to work a little magic? Haven't we defended an interpretation that the client resisted because we needed to be right? Haven't we told stories that flirted with the violation of confidentiality because we wanted somebody else to admire us? The list goes on, and I'm sure you could add your own examples. Moreover, it's not just what therapists do with their power, but what they do when they feel powerless. And we'll discuss this in the next lecture on compassion, but clients don't always follow the script in which they're supposed to come as supplicants to learn from the therapist's wisdom. They don't submit to the therapist's supposed expertise, but they push back. Or they seem to gratefully receive that expertise in the session and then ignore it outside of the session. <laughs> and then the therapist is left wondering, why are they coming? Is it just because they want to come and have a place to complain? Is it me? Am I incompetent? And how much longer before this session is over? <laughs> Interventions don't always work as dramatically as they do in the textbooks, and often they don't work at all. One research team, for example, examined therapeutic outcomes at a university counseling center over a period of six years, 71 therapists, and over 6,000 clients. And if their results are at all representative of therapists generally, the expectation would then be that less than half of the clients of even the best therapists will improve or recover in therapy. And some will be worse off than when they started. Now that's what I call grounds for humility. <laughs> but let me stir the pot even more. Another research team asked 129 private practitioners to rate their clinical skills, rate their own skills, give themselves a percentile rank compared to other people with the same kind of training. And they also asked participants to estimate what percentage of their clients pursue, uh, improved, stayed the same, or deteriorated. The result? A fourth of the sample placed themselves in the 90th percentile or above. <laughs> in other words, 25% of the participants thought of themselves as being in the top 10% of clinicians. <laughs> On average, clinicians rated themselves as being in the 80th percentile, and nobody rated themselves as being below average. Furthermore, over half of the clinicians said that 80% of their clients improved, which is almost double what was said in the earlier study. A fifth of the sample believed that 90% of their clients improved, and for the sample overall, the estimate was over 77%. Now, either this research team just happened to pick the best clinic in the world, or there's a Lake Wobegon effect going on here. When it comes to rating our own skills and success rate, therapists and probably other professionals as well all want to see ourselves as above average. To the extent that the perceptions fail to actually tally with reality, so much for having accurate, humble self-perceptions. There are very real challenges to being a therapist and limits to what a therapist can do. And nothing can take all of those challenges away. Not higher degrees, not more workshops, not even years of experience. Challenges and limitations need to be recognized and accepted because they represent opportunities to grow. We need to re-examine our self-perceptions. We need to re-examine our vocational narratives. The modernist understanding of what it means to be a professional is at best a partial truth. We do have power, we do have knowledge, but what narrative will help us to hold together our integrity when we have to make sense of both our professional power and our powerlessness? What narrative will sustain us when our so-called talking cure seems to be more talking than cure? Again, for therapists who follow Christ, I propose the narrative of peacemaking. We need the hope-filled eschatological Im imagination to see our work as being caught up in the ongoing restorative work of God. And from that perspective, the percentage of people that we've cured through expert intervention is not the measure of our work. We don't have to save humanity one client at a time. 
Rather, as those who are called to be peacemakers, whatever the long-term outcome of a case, we can take joy in witnessing moments of shalom as they unfold. When people truly listen to each other instead of putting up walls, when they take responsibility instead of blaming, when they turn toward each other instead of turning away. Again, clients don't come seeking to grow in humility, but one way or another, they have been humbled by life and they're looking for hope. Do we have the imagination to see them as deeply loved by God, the God who champions the poor in spirit? Briefly, here I think of Jesus's attitude towards children. You remember how it was with his disciples. They struggled a little bit with their pride and their sense of significance. And then Jesus goes and he pulls a child and sits them in the midst of them. And he says, truly, I tell you, unless you become like children, you will never enter the kingdom. And something like this happened twice between Jesus and his disciples. He's trying to tell them, you must be like children. He's already told them that the kingdom belongs to those who are poor in spirit. And this was almost like an enacted parable of that. He embraced, he blessed the children. Now, children aren't humble by choice. They can't be said to display humility as a virtue, but Jesus loved them because of their powerlessness and their vulnerability. And in so doing, he demonstrated the nature of God and of God's kingdom. Now, I think here of the fact that many clinicians these days are working from an attachment perspective in which a client's current behavior is understood as stemming in part from how they experience the emotional vulnerabilities of childhood. Even the most arrogant and troublesome of, of clients can be so for self-protective and defensive reasons. Their lack of relational humility is a shield against feelings of humiliation. The question for us is whether or not we can bracket our own negative reactions to our clients' provocations and imagine them as the vulnerable children whom Jesus delighted to embrace and to bless. And what might change about our therapeutic stance if we did? The children that Jesus blessed didn't have any choice about their vulnerability, their low social status. They were not humble in the sense of possessing virtuous character, but in the sense of being humbled by their circumstances and by their place in society. Jesus, however, did give his disciples a choice. See this child? You must become like this. You're so concerned about your personal greatness, and you think of the kingdom in those terms. Other kingdoms may work that way, but not this one, not the kingdom of God. So once more, the pronouncement that the kingdom belongs to the poor in spirit is good news to those who are poor in spirit, it may be bad news to anyone else, or at least paradoxical news. Nobody wants powerlessness or shame, especially those who have been indoctrinated into a proud culture of professional competence and expertise. I submit that what we need in order to be empowered in the virtue of humility is the virtue of hope, because the two go hand in hand. We can both celebrate our successes and humbly learn from our failures when we understand that our work has been taken up into the peacemaking purposes of God and thereby sanctified. The clinical virtue of hope is not a matter of believing that every client will get better or that every intervention will be effective because there are just way too many factors involved in any therapy outcome, many of which are outside our control. Our hope is not simply for the future of our clients, but for the future of all creation under the ministrations of a gracious and promise-keeping God. In that hope, we can cling less tightly to our own needs for power and significance. In that hope, we are better able to endure the ups and downs of clinical work as we continue to work for peace. And so too will our clients draw both comfort and confidence from our non-anxious, humble, and hopeful presence. Or so we hope. Mm -hmm.